Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video from Maranatha. We hope that you are encouraged by watching this and our prayer is, is that you would encounter Jesus right where you are today. Genesis 37, turn with me, Genesis 37. I want to talk to you this morning about freedom in forgiveness. Freedom in forgiveness. In Genesis chapter 37, and, and let, me, let, let, me, uh, let me preface something. I'm going to talk about Joseph this morning. And it never fails, somewhere along the way, I call Joseph, um, Jacob, or Joshua. Never fails. Just understand, if I say Jacob, or Joshua, or Joseph, I'm actually talking about Joseph. Except when I read the scripture when it talks about Jacob. Okay? So just tell your neighbor, he means Joseph. You all feel free to just laugh and amen and jump in with me, all right? In Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11, now Jacob, and I mean Jacob there because that's what Scripture said. Jacob dwelled in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was uh, with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zelpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his children, than, than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. He also made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Man, it's just bad. It just gets darker and darker. How many of you know that when the Father has favor on you, you're going to be hated by some people? Which would you rather have? The acceptance of people or the favor of the Father? Verse 6, so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood also around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Freedom in forgiveness. When the Holy Spirit reveals his will, direction, or dream to you, you never see all that's connected to it. I mean, you think about that. It's amazing to me that God will give someone a dream and they're ready to set the world on fire. And then they go through, through a little bit of uh, chaos, through a little bit of trouble, and that dream is far from them because they went through a little bit of trouble. The key is that trouble is part of the dream. And the thing about it is when God gives us a dream or gives us a word, we never see, he never allows us to see everything that's connected to it. Reason being, if we saw everything, we'd quit before we get started, or at least most of us would. Can somebody say amen? Now think about this. Joseph is 17 years old. He has a dream. And approximately 27 years later, he sees the fulfillment of it. Some of you are in your year 27, 28, maybe even 29, and wondering, when is my dream going to come to pass? You just hold on. God is faithful. He's going to bring that dream to pass when you're ready. And when I say you're ready, not in your readiness, but in God's readiness of you. In other words, you're like that turkey in the oven. Your red popper hasn't popped yet. Tell your neighbor, you think you're ready, but you haven't popped yet. Now, for just a minute, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. You're 17 years old, and you're the favorite son of 12 sons. And your father, being the youngest, has chosen you 
to lead, to be the head of your family. And he's given you a beautiful colorized robe to symbolize that fact. And you are on your path to power, influence, and prominence in your family. Now get this, this was Joseph's dad's dream for him. But then God gets involved. When God gets involved, he messes everything up. Because now, after his, his father tries to elevate him and make the youngest one, which, which didn't happen, when his father tried to elevate him, being the youngest and make him head of the family, God gets involved and gives the youngest one a dream. God gets involved and gives him a dream, not just to rule a family, but to govern a nation. See, your family's dream for you will never be as great or as grand as God's dream for you. The key is this, don't be bound by the principles of men, but allow God to take you into the fullness that he has for you. Somebody say amen. Let's look at this path that God chose to get him to his dream. See, when you walk out the, the dream that God has for you, it's not by your choosing as to what you do and when you do it. It's always by God's timing. Tell your neighbor it's always by God's timing. When God calls you or when God gets involved, you can't control the direction. So in other words, when God gives you a dream, you don't get to choose what you walk through and what you don't walk through. You, you understand where I'm going now. The reason being some things happen to you is just because of what's on the inside of you and God placed it there. Yeah. I had this thought the other day and, and it's, you know, uh, everybody knows here that I, I, I'm, I might be a little crazy, but just go ahead and we'll just validate the fact today. But, but, but I had this, this thought the other day that I wonder if the Trinity has ever had a conversation about us. Have you ever thought about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having a conversation about you? Have you ever thought about them just sitting around and saying, hey, Holy Ghost, what, 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 what do you think about Judy? Here's the plan. How are we going to get her there? She's married to, to, to Mike Lytle, and, 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 and after, after the death of her, her, her husband, now, now, now this is my plan. How, how am I going to get her? Where's she going to have to walk through? What's the pain she's going to have to endure before I get her where I want her to be? I'm not meaning to preach about you, Judy, but you just happen to be looking all glorious and beautiful, and there you are. <laughs> but Debbie, have you ever thought about maybe the Trinity having a conversation about you? Have you ever thought about when, 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 with the episode with your husband and all of, all of the tragedy that you went through in your life, have you ever thought that it might just be a part of God's grand scale because of what he has for you is greater than what you can see for yourself? But the key is we can't get stuck in the hurt and the pain. Are you with me? Now let's think about this about Joseph for a minute. Think about the Trinity having a conversation about Joseph, about his plan and direction. And God's sitting around, he says, hey, he said, I, he said, we got this boy Joseph down there. And we got to get him from Canaan to Egypt. And how are we going to do that? And the thing about it is, as we get him from Canaan to Egypt, I don't want him to just rule a family. I want him to govern a nation. I want to be able to trust him with all the grain in the world. We're going to have to trust him with what the world needs. You know, as I look out on you, you remind me a little bit about Joseph. Because God has entrusted you with what the world need, needs, and his name's Jesus Christ. And he turns around and he says, listen, we got to get my boy here. We got to get him to Egypt because I want to trust him with what the world needs. And, 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 but we have to develop some things on the inside of him as he goes along because he, he's got the calling, but he's not ready yet. And many of you, you have a calling, you have a word, but you want to get there, but you're just not quite ready yet. And then and, and Jesus says, well, you know, he's got to be strong and, and he's got to deal with rejection. And the only way that you deal with rejection is you got to be rejected first. Bear with me now. And then the Holy Ghost says, well, you know what? He's going to have to uh, not be able to give in to temptation. And the only way he doesn't give in to temptation is he has to be tempted. 
He has to have impeccable integrity. And the only way you do that is you got to face some compromise somewhere along the way. He's got to bring, be patient. So let's bring in some tribulation and he's got to be mature and forgiving. That means he's got to have a situation where he doesn't want to forgive. Can somebody say amen? And then they go on to say, he has to learn how to see us in every situation. He has to present, God the Father speaks up. He said, he has to present my heart to a foreign land. You're looking more and more like Joseph. And the Trinity, I, I'm, you know, just paraphrase, just, just, just ad-libbing this. He, Trinity's sitting around having this conversation. How are we going to get him from Canaan to Egypt? And somebody had, one of the three had a bright idea. Let's start with his brothers. And his brothers, I just read to you in verses 4 through 11, they hated Joseph. We read there that he hate, they hated Joseph, couldn't speak peaceably uh, to him. They hated him more. And then it says they hated him even more. And it says they envied him and it was jealous of him. And then in verse 19 of, of 37, when Joseph was coming to him while they was working in the field, they said, look, here comes the dreamer. And as he began to walk closer to them, someone said, hey, why don't we just get rid of him? Why don't we just do him in? Why don't we just go ahead and kill him? That way it takes the favored son out of the equation. Let's just get rid of him. And then one of the, one of the wise brothers stepped up and said, well, you know, why don't we, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in this big pit. Let's just throw him in this big hole. So when he came close, they tore his clothes off of him tore that coat of many collars off of him and threw him into a pit. And then they saw this Medianite trader making his way through. And they said, hey, let's sell him to this Medianite trader. At least we can make some money. And they took that robe, dipped it in blood and took it back to his dad and said a, a vicious animal killed him and the father saw, thought the son was dead. And they sold him into slavery. They tore off his clothes and sold him into slavery. Now get a hold of this. They sold him into slavery trying to kill the dream that God had placed on the inside of him. What they did not realize is that dream that God placed on the inside of him would one day save their lives. What people failed to realize, they may ridicule you, they may cut you down, they even may sell you out, they may condemn you and falsely accuse you, but let me tell you something of God, one day they're going to quickly realize they need what God has placed on the inside of you. That's why you must make it. It isn't about you. It's about God. The key is, will you go on to maturity? Will you be faithful with what God's placed on the inside? You may be a nobody to a lot of people, but you're somebody to God. You carry the kingdom on the inside of you. You may have been rejected, ridiculed, and condemned your entire life, and you may go to uh, the, the city park tonight and speak one word to a prostitute that may forever change their soul. You don't know what God has for you. My Lord, I'm feeling this this morning. But here he deals with the sting of betrayal and hatred. He is hated by his brothers. And he's betrayed by those closest to him. And this is Joseph. He's dealing with that. He shows up just wanting to be part of the gang. And because of their hatred, they rip his clothes off and throw him into a pit. And now Joseph's very own has turned against him and hated him and betrayed him. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. Then in Genesis 39, and I'm just going to skip down through a lot of this. In Genesis 39, 1 through 6, that Medianite trader that showed up and, and purchased Joseph as a slave, he gets him from, to Egypt. Now he is from Canaan to Egypt. Tell your neighbor he's finally where God wants him to be. How many of you have ever felt like you're in a foreign land that you weren't created to walk in? But it just might be that foreign land that God created you to live in. Don't get caught up in comfortable, y'all. Don't get caught up in comfort. You just keep the peace of God in your heart and move on. In Genesis 9, uh, 39, 1 through 6, now this Medianite uh, trader put him on the auction block and he is now sold 
to a, to a worker of Pharaoh named Potiphar, and he is the he, he is is over the guard of Pharaoh, and 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 Potiphar buys Joseph, and oh, I'm, I'm going to hit this one here, and he buys Joseph and takes him as a slave, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, and, and and listen to this. Potiphar begins to realize that there's something great on the inside of this young man. And he can see it in verse 2 and verse 2 of 39. Now, now, now look at this. It, it, this is incredible. The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. It says that Joseph was successful. And what has he done? The only thing he's done is had a dream, been thrown into a pit and sold, sold into slavery. Here we see the difference between man's opinion of success and God's opinion of success. Don't you live your life based on man's opinion of your life success or anything else. God said, this is my son, I'm with him, uh, he's successful, and you can find his success because I'm walking with him. And then in verses 3 and 4, Potiphar said he could see something on him that no one else could see. He saw something in him that he didn't see on the other slaves. Potiphar may not have known what it was, but it was the presence of God and the success of God in the life of Joseph. Somebody say amen. Potiphar could see it, and because Potiphar could see it, Potiphar instantly knew he could be trusted. And in verse 4, Potiphar entrusts him with all the authority in his house. He's a slave. And Potiphar trusts him with it. Then in verses 7 through 14, I believe this is a test of temptation and integrity. Now listen to me. Now favor is on him. The anointing of God is on him. How many of you know when favor and the anointing of God is on you, you're beautiful? When you're under the anointing of God, you are attractive. Listen to me. And everybody around you thinks it's you, but you know it isn't you. It just looks like you. You know it's God shining through you. Listen, we're, we're, we're nothing, and, and there's very little good on the inside of us unless the Holy Ghost is, is anointing us. And as soon as, we look, as soon as the anointing hits us, then we look attractive to a lot of different people around us. Can somebody say amen? And that anointing attracts. And because the anointing on his life, Potiphar's wife said, hey, there's a new boy in town. And he's looking pretty good. And she tries to seduce this new slave because Potiphar's wife was attracted to Joseph. In verse 9, we find out, but listen, he, he, she, comes, she comes to Joseph and she says, listen. She tries to seduce him and, and tries to get him to sleep with her. And he said, no, I cannot do that. I believe this is a test of the kingdom. I believe that integrity is always a test of the kingdom. He said, I can't do that. He said, let me tell you something. He said, my master Potiphar has given me ruler. He's made me ruler over all of his house and not withheld anything from me except you. And he said, I will not cross that line. I will not cross that line. And the reason why I believe it is a test for the kingdom is because you cannot be trusted with what belongs to God until you've been found faithful with what belongs to another man. It was a test of the kingdom. We always want, want, want. And we undercut and we manipulate to get what we want. But let me tell you something. We're trying to achieve the kingdom and we achieve the kingdom by one way. And it's through impeccable integrity. It is leaving alone what is not ours and only assuming what God has placed upon us. Let me tell you something. The church is God's bride. The church does not belong to a pastor or a group of elders or deacons. The church belongs to Jesus Christ, the almighty God, and he will not stand for any man to put his hand on his bride. Many have tried. And we act like we've got ownership to the bride of Christ when we do not. It's his bride, and he will not stand for anyone to put their hand on his bride. It's a test of the kingdom. May we be found faithful with the test. Then in Genesis 39 through 40, Joseph is falsely accused of rape. When he turned, when, when he turned Potiphar's wife down, she didn't take rejection real well, so she cried rape falsely. 
And when you're a slave and you're Potiphar's wife, guess who they're going to believe? So he was falsely accused of rape and and thrown in prison, and he was in prison for 11 years. Here, God is doing a work of brokenness, isolation, and patience. How many of you have ever walked down that road of brokenness, isolation, and patience? But even in prison, tell your neighbor, even in prison, it says in verse 23 that God was with him. He'll never leave you and never forsake you. It doesn't matter how dark the day. It doesn't matter how still the night. God said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. He said, I am El Shaddai. I am more than enough. I'm more than enough in the daylight, and I'm more enough in the nighttime. I'm more than enough when it's loud around you, and I'm more than enough when it's still around you. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And in that prison, when he got thrown in there, he met two people, a butler and a baker. The funny thing was, they each had dreams too. And they began to share their dreams with Joseph, and Joseph began to interpret those dreams. And he told the baker, he said, well, you know, I hate to tell you this, but your dream means that you're going to lose your head in three days. And then the butler comes up a little bit timid as to whether to share his dream after the first report. And he went ahead and shared his dream. He said, well, good news for you. You're going to be restored back to your original position within three days. And Joseph looked at the butler and he said, listen, this is what I ask of you. That when you get out of here, please remember me. Verse 14, he said, please remember me. And then in verse 23 of that same chapter, it said that the butler forgot him. Then Pharaoh had a dream. And no one could do anything with it. And all at once, the one that had forgotten him remembered about this old boy in prison that interpreted his dream. God dealt with my heart about this right here. See, many of you, you think God's forgotten about you. Ah, Let me just go ahead and preach it the way I know it. Many of you have had a word from God. And it hasn't come to pass when or the way you thought it should have. And the devil has said it's because you haven't performed well. It's because you haven't done exactly what was acceptable. And because you haven't done what is acceptable, God's turned his back on you and the devil is a liar. God has not nor will he turn his back on you. He may be waiting for you to come to yourself in that pig pen. But as soon as you come to yourself, he's going to pick you up and he's going to put you right back in your rightful place. Many people think God's forgotten about you. God hasn't forgotten about you. He has you hidden. He's hidden you in the cleft of the rock to keep you from certain things, to keep you from certain people so they wouldn't ruin you. But now God, all at once, God's beginning to open you up. All at once, God's beginning to make you known. Uh, God dealt with my heart this morning about how God was going to begin to reveal the prophetic in a woman's life. She's very timid. She's very quiet. But God, I sense, was getting ready to use her in a prophetic way. The reason why God used uses people who's very quiet prophetically is because they're usually quiet. So that when they see this begin coming from a vessel, it's usually quiet. They know it's authentic. Ah. Sometimes God hides. You tell your neighbor, sometimes God hides you. Well, go ahead. Tell your neighbor he's not disappointed in you. He's not angry at you and he's not mad at you and he don't hate you. He loves you and he's about to bring you forth. God, I'll stir myself up. So Pharaoh has a dream nobody can do anything with. They call Joseph out of prison. Now all at once, finally, it looks like it's all going to take place. Shackles falling off. Think about that. In prison, boop, boop, shackles falling off. Doesn't know for sure where he's going, but as soon as he sees the palace, hey, this is looking better. This is looking better. I thought Potiphar's house looked nice. Whoa, look at this. Man, I hope his wife doesn't come after me too. I mean, think about all the things going on through his mind, poor kid. So he's walking in the palace saying, oh, man, this could be it. This could be the day. And Pharaoh says, listen, Pharaoh says, he said, I've had a dream, and I need you to interpret it. And Joseph said, go ahead, tell me your dream. Pharaoh told him his dream, and Joseph said, this is the deal. That's what the dream means. He said, there's going to be seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. The key is in the seven years of prosperity, we've got to store up all the grain so that we can have something to live off of in the seven years of, 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 of uh, famine. And Pharaoh was so amazed in, in, in chapter 41, chapter 41, 37 through 42, and for sake of time, I won't read it. 
But he was so amazed. He said, I've never seen anybody with this much of the Spirit of God on them. Even Pharaoh, even an enemy to God, recognized God's presence in him. He said, I've never seen anyone with the Spirit of God on him like this. Listen to this counsel. Listen to this wisdom. He said, listen, he, 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 has anyone else heard anything like this? We're going to put him over all this kingdom. Now think about this. This is a prison. This is a slave boy that goes from the darkness of a dungeon and the second in command of the greatest nation of the world. And then we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well, God can't do nothing with me. If he did it with Joseph, he could do it with you. Oh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Just let, just let me get this. So he interprets a dream and Pharaoh said, listen, you're going to be second in command of this nation. He said he took off his signet ring and put it on Joseph. He said, only by the throne will I be greater than you. He said, you have rule over all this nation. God's given you the dream. He's given you the interpretation of it. Now you rule it. From the dungeon to the palace. In seconds. Second in command. And I don't know about you, but I can't help but think that Joseph is probably like, wow, finally. How many of you know that when you're second in command of a great nation like Egypt, that everybody's bowing down to you? And I'm sure as people are bowing down, he's thinking, finally, the fulfillment of the dream. The dream that I had, I thought it was my brother's. But no, it was a nation. It was much grander than that. Amen? Wow, isn't God good? Look at all that God brought me through. Look where God has brought me to. And now all is going well for Joseph. Finds a beautiful young woman, marries her, and has two kids. And then in Genesis 42, verses 6 and 9, all is going well. And then in verses 6 through 9, his brothers show up. He thought he was beyond all that. All at once, his past shows up. Wait a minute. I've just seen my dream fulfilled. And now my past is showing up. In 42 verse 9, it says that Joseph remembered the dreams that he had. So in other words, right now, all those old feelings of hatred and betrayal now come back to the surface. But it was during that moment of those feelings of hatred and betrayal that his literal dream was fulfilled because his brothers are now bowing down to him. Can somebody say amen? But said he remembered the dream. Now get this. The thing that God placed in him now has an attachment of pain. The dream that God placed in him now has an attachment of betrayal and hatred. What is going on? Why did God allow that? Every time God places a dream on the inside of you, the enemy will always come along and try to attach some form of pain to the dream to keep you from fulfilling the dream. Because if the enemy can keep you wrapped up in your pain, your hatred, and your bitterness long enough, betrayal long enough, it will abort the general dream that God gave you. And you thought God forgot you. You thought your dream was no longer intact. It's well intact. We've just allowed some form of pain to be attached to the dream that God placed in us. And what has the upper hand right now? That dream or that pain? Man, I, I, I'm telling you, that's good stuff. Why would God allow that? What is God doing in that? True freedom. True freedom. Not limited or partial freedom. Why would God allow this? True freedom. God wasn't finished shaping Joseph yet. Last thing that he wanted to deal with was forgiveness. And family restoration. The last thing he dealt with was forgiveness. Because God wasn't finished shaping Joseph. 
I know we're great people, we're miraculous. We're special to God. And God's going to use us in a mighty way, but not before he deals with our heart about forgiveness. Because freedom is in forgiveness. True freedom is found in forgiveness. Freedom in forgiving the past. It's what Joseph had to do. Facing the past and dealing with the truth of the past is freedom. Well, it got quiet. A.W. Tozer once said, it is doubtful that God ever used anyone greatly without first hurting them deeply. <clears throat> See, we don't like those kind of statements. In fact, if I was to just make that kind of statement on my own, you'd rebuke me. But since it was A.W. Tozer, we'll let it go because he's dead now. says that it's doubtful that God would ever use someone greatly without first hurting them deeply. Why? Because you can't give what you don't possess. We all want to be used to speak greatly prophetically, but let me tell you something, child of God. You can't generally give what you don't have. Oh, you can give a flip of this or that, but you can't genuinely give it from the heart of God until we've walked through it. We want to act like we're all spiritual and high and mighty. Act, act, act. I don't want act. I want genuine. I don't want a counterfeit, counterfeit and I don't want the prophetic, prophetic, uh, uh, pathetic. I want the genuine. Yeah. And it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that we can, we can um, uh, well, we got plenty of time. It's amazing to me that when you hear of a job opening, you get your resume out and you, you shine it all up and you update it and latest doctrine and latest this and latest that and oh, don't forget this class here. You put that down, you make yourself look as good as you can, you take it in and you plop it down. And it looks good, it looks pristine. No negatives, there's no negatives on a resume. No weaknesses on a resume, Amen. But man, I'm thankful that when God looks at my resume, mm, I'm thankful it doesn't have to be pristine. I'm thankful it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm thankful that it, I'm thankful that it has my weaknesses, but in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. I, I'm thankful that in that, in my faults and flaws, his blood's covered it and erased it, and it's gone now. I, I'm thankful that in God's resume, oh, let me, sh let me see where you've walked. Let me know what you've walked through. Let me know about betrayal. Let me know about the bitterness. Let me know what you had to forgive. Let me know about what's been done to you and let me see if you've overcome it. That's God's resume for your life. Some of us, we want to act like we didn't have a past. You think it's going to get you higher. Listen, you're not going to get anywhere higher by faking it. Fake it till you make it. That's a lie. And nobody in the kingdom wants anything fake. If they do, it isn't genuine. I want the authentic, unadulterated, pure word of God, spirit of God dwelling inside of me. It's doubtful that God would ever use anyone greatly without first hurting them deeply. Man, we don't like it. God wouldn't hurt you. Well, he'd allow it. You think, oh, I'm going, I'm going. We think, oh, well, God wouldn't do that. That's the devil. Let me tell you something about the devil. He's not omnipresent. He isn't everywhere. He's wherever the greatest move of God is going on at that time in the earth. And no, no disrespect to you, <laughs> but I doubt it's going on in your life right now. No, no disrespect. Hear me now. But wherever the greatest advancement of the kingdom of God is, that's where the enemy's fighting. But the enemy has imps and little demons here and there. He'll, he'll plant, they'll plant little things in your mind. Well, you're not that good. And just trying to abort. Just trying to get you to give up on what God's planted on the inside of you. And this is what I've come to be, come to know is truth. Is, see, it isn't just about getting saved and stopping there. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. And if the enemy can't, give, can't get you, 
keep you from getting saved. Well, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll just let, let them go ahead and get saved. But let's just, th that thing that God planted in them, let's just plant a little pain in with that. And maybe, maybe they'll just stay satisfied with salvation only. But they won't go on to the great things that God wants to use them to do. And we'll just use that pain to pull the reins back and hold them just right where we want them to be. And it isn't until we truly forgive that you're able to let those reins out and you're able to run with God. Oh, I thank God for the times that I've crawled with God. I, I'm thankful for the times that I've walked with God. Oh, but there's quickly coming a day, bless God, that I'm going to run with God. We're going to run, run, and run, and not grow weary. But it's only through forgiveness that that freedom comes. Man. Why? To know freedom and forgiveness, that's why. There's power in forgiveness. We can't give what we don't have. Is it just talk or is it genuine? Free people, free people. If hurt people hurt people, my wife says hurt people are mean people. And the reason why hurt people are mean people is because hurt people have an opportunity to be free, but they get stuck in the pain. And they allow betrayal and bitterness to get the upper hand and they become mean and they spread it everywhere they go. See, you can't help but genuinely spread every, whatever's on the inside of you. If pain and betrayal and bitterness is, that's what you're going to vomit. But if freedom is on the inside of you, that's what people around you are going to get. Free people, free people. Not partial freedom, complete freedom. Somebody say amen. And I'll close it out if the group would come. Freedom is the ability to be who you were created and redeemed to be. That's freedom. Oh. So Joseph Pass shows up. And he has a little difficulty at first. He wasn't perfect. He had a little difficulty letting it go. But then in Genesis 45, 1 through 8, in verses 1 through 3, he makes himself known to his brothers. He said, listen, I'm your brother Joseph, the one that you've thrown into prison. But then in verses, I want to read verses 4 through 8. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years of which there will be neither plowing or harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in this earth to save your lives by this great deliverance. Now you think about that right there. Joseph is seeing something that he hadn't seen before. And the only way he can see what he hasn't seen before is because he's experienced freedom and forgiveness. And now all at once he went from blaming his brothers for selling him into slavery to celebrating his brothers for doing it. Because now he no, no longer looks at his brother selling him, but God brought me here. God brought me here to preserve life. See, whenever, whenever, we, whenever we don't forgive freely, we are limited on what we see and what we understand. But the instant that we forgive, we, it's just like we're backed up and we can see a grander scale. Now it goes from Joseph to his family. It's no longer just about Joseph and what's good for Joseph. Now it's his entire family. It's really about Israel, his dad. Israel. And he said, God sent me here before you because he wanted to make a way for my family to live, my heritage to live, Israel to live. If you stay in Canaan, you're going to die in Canaan. But God sent me here, put me second in command to go through hell just so you could have life, just so my dad's legacy would live on. That's why God brought me here. And because of that, he was able to see God in everything 
that took place. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. The key is this. Don't get stuck in the hurt of the past. Don't get stuck in it. When we forgive, it does two things. It erases the past and it disarms the devil. It's what happens. It's what happened when Jesus forgave on the cross. Remember, I read it last week, Colossians 2, 15. It said he publicly humiliated Satan by his victory over him on the cross. In other words, he put Satan under our feet. And when he, when he defeated Satan on the cross, he did two things. He wiped away the past and he disarmed the devil. So in other words, as long as we don't forgive, the enemy can pull that weapon out and beat us with it any time he wants to because we, and he has legal right to do it because we've never forgiven. But when we forgive, the enemy no longer has that weapon to beat us with. And let me tell you all something. I'm not preaching anything I haven't had to walk through myself. Just because I'm pastor doesn't mean that my life's just glorious all the time. I've been hurt and betrayed just like you. But bless God, I don't want to get stuck in the hurt in the past. I'll never see the dream come to fulfillment if that's the case. And God's given me some dreams, Pastor Terry. He's given me some dreams. And I want to see him come to pass. Bless God. When I see people now, I can genuinely love them. When I see people now, the enemy doesn't get out that weapon and beat me over the head with it. I can love free. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. And it only comes through forgiveness. Let me wrap it up. The key is don't get stuck in the hurt. Tell your neighbor, don't get stuck in the hurt. This is the revelation God gave me about this whole, whole passage of Scripture. The moment of true freedom is not when the shackles come off. You think about that. Joseph probably thought when those shackles come off in prison, Woo, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. True freedom does not come when the shackles come off. True freedom comes when you forgive the ones who put the shackles on. True freedom comes when we forgive the ones who placed the shackles on us to begin with. Just because the shackles are off doesn't mean you've forgiven. But freedom comes when we forgive the one who condemned us when when they betray us, when they ridiculed us, when, when they slammed you on Facebook, get over it. Your dream is being limited. And let me tell you something, it runs a risk of being aborted if you don't get past that pain. Because what the enemy wants to do is get you to abort the dream that God's placed on the inside of you. And the only way he can do that is for you to stay stuck in the hurt of the past. Hey, thanks for watching. We hope that you enjoyed this message. Real quick, there's three things that we want you to do. First, we just want to encourage you to share this video with someone who might need it or comment below. We'd love to see how these videos are impacting people. Second, if you feel led, click the Give button below to support the ministry so that we can continue to love people, build strong families, and transform cities all over the world. And last, if there's anything that stuck out to you from this message that you would like to share, or if you need prayer, email us at prayforme at mfctoday.org. Thanks again for watching.